um, 2 Samuel chapter 24 tonight. And it's been a journey through 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. And um, we're going to wrap it up tonight in 2 Samuel chapter 24. Amen. The worship music was so good tonight. Amen. Uh, I have a shameless plug to put in. Um, in a few weeks when they start the family dinner hour. Oh, I'm going to run around the property. Dear brother, when you cook um, in a few weeks, amen. Whatever you cook, I'm going to eat it. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm going to have me two oatmeal cookies in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Whoever's serving that night better give me two cookies. I've been on a fast since last November um, from Wednesday night, so we need to reinstitute that quickly. Amen. <laughs> you know, when we're going through um, 1 Samuel, especially the end of um, 1 Samuel, it seemed like the author put the spotlight on um, David at times and put it on Saul sometimes. We learned the best of um, David and we learned the worst of David. I wish we could say the same thing about Saul, but Saul was on a downward trajectory um, for the rest of the chapter. And then as we got to um, 2 Samuel, we got to see David, how he came into power, how he was over Hebron for um, seven and a half years. Then he became king over all of Israel after Ishbosheth was um, murdered, of course. We got to see his, um, how, he, um, um, how he ruled and reigned. We got to see Joab working um, alongside him. Of course, we got to see some of his um, worst moments in um, 2 Samuel as well. We got to see things like his affair with Bathsheba it was probably a low point for David, even though um, from a military standpoint, he was winning every war that he had, but he was winning every war that he had on the outside, but he wasn't necessarily winning the war on the inside. And, of course, he had the affair with Bathsheba. In chapter 12, the sword will never depart from your house. <coughs> That's what Nathan the prophet tells him after he addressed him as a king. Um, and it was interesting. You have the rape of Tamar in chapter 13. Um, um, and then you had his son, Ammon, killed by Absalom, who avenged his sister, rape. And then you have Absalom that's trying to overthrow his dad. Um, one, one professor that I had in um, seminary used to call this section All My Children. Um, y'all remember that? No, y'all don't remember the soap opera. Y'all never watched that. But he used to call it All My Children. And you, you kept seeing how things kept coming up. But um, you remember you had Absalom that tried to overthrow David. And, of course, David didn't want Absalom's life taken. But you know Joab took his life anyway. Y'all nodding y'all head, y'all remember that? And then you remember Sheba, who did the same thing. But um, David wasn't as kind to Sheba as he was um, Absalom, took his life as well. And the reason why I'm telling you those stories, because as we get to chapter 24, David wants to reassess what he has. He wants to look and see, you know, take a census so to speak, of what he has. He wants to assess his military strength. Um, verse 1 says, Now again the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and it incited David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. Um, we know this census was taken um, approximately 575 um, B.C., somewhere along in there. We know it comes near the end of David's reign. And David wants to see after the rise of um, Absalom and after the rise of Sheba, what does he have next? Um, now the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. Um, I think it was the verse, let me look it up to make sure. It's in, um, yeah, the book of First Chronicles, chapter 21, verse 1. 
it, it, it kind of lets us know that Satan was the one that put this in David's heart to kind of um, to get a sense or a sense of what he had. Now, I want to say it clearly to you all. Um, taking a census in itself wasn't bad. That wasn't the sin. The sin was when you started depending on your numbers or the strength of your numbers more than you depend on the promises of God. Or if I can say it plainly like this, it is when you start depending on your military might versus God's might. You all with me here? So taking a census in itself isn't bad. And I read that over in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 7. It wasn't the census that got him in trouble. It was, it was depending more on, on his own military might than God's might. I need to take a moment here and ask you all a question. This is going to almost turn this into a Sunday morning sermon. Y'all ready for a Sunday morning sermon on Wednesday night? This is a Sunday. We can call this a revival service if we need to. Let's, let's have a revival service. Y'all ready? Okay, good. Is there anything in your life that you depend on more than you depend on God? Is there anything in your life that you depend on more than you depend on God? I'm glad I got a couple of no's from the audience. That, that was really cool. Can I ask it the third time? I, I want to be baptistic tonight. You know, you got to ask it three times if you're going to be baptistic. You hear that, Steve? If you're going to be baptistic, you got to ask it the third time. One for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Okay. Here it is. Is there anything in your life that you depend on more than you depend on God? I'm, I'm glad. Somebody, who that saying no back there? Who's that? You saying no? I should almost let you come and do the rest of the lesson tonight. Y'all want a little honesty? I wonder how honest should I be with this audience. Y'all are my, y'all are my friends, so I'm going to just go ahead and be honest with you. I asked myself that question this week. And I cried a couple of times. Because I don't know if I always put my might in God. Because sometimes I trust some other things. Was that okay to tell you all? I know y'all shame of me now. I'd be shame of me too. You said, what else do you put your might in? Sometimes I put my might in having a good job. And God has to remind me from time to time, your job is your resource, not your source. See, I don't mind telling y'all this because maybe I have two or three people that do the same thing in here. Sometimes I put my, um, I come from a good family. I say, praise the Lord for that. And God says, um, you know, when your mother and father forsake you, then the Lord will pick you up. <clears throat> um, I'm in my second midlife crisis. So statistics tell me. I'm in my second midlife crisis. And one of the things I do every day, several times a day, y'all okay with me confessing? I don't know if y'all okay with me confessing like this. But one thing I do during the day, I look at my stocks, and I see where I am with the stock market. And I, I have a real good day as long as they go up. But when they go down, I get sad. And um, the Lord has to remind me that, I'm, that he's my retirement plan. Now, it doesn't, doesn't mean I shouldn't be faithful to save for retirement or to save money in case I I die, and Sylvia, I have to leave Sylvia some money. That's my wife, and Adriana and Savannah, so they can um, get it from my wife. But you know what? The Lord has to remind me every now and then that he's my source. 
Now, how am I doing for you all tonight? Let me, let me ask you one more time. You know, is there anything that you depend on more than you depend on God? I, I'm glad you still got your no. And I wish I had my no. I wish I had her no as strong as her no. But I feel like even, even as I stand up before you tonight, I, I think God is still taking things out of my hand that says, trust in me. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. And for the five or six people in the audience that's like me tonight, continue to let God have it. Continue to let God have it. Oh, and for David, a man's after God's own heart. Now, I know I'm messing with New Testament theology versus Old Testament theology. I get that. But somehow Satan stirred his heart to, um, to ask for a census. Um, and I just want to remind you, make sure Satan never gets in your heart so deeply that you start counting your resources or counting on your resources more than you count on your source. And that's God. I'm going to say hallelujah to my revival sermon. Yeah. Hallelujah. Because I um, want to do it. My wife has been threatening me like, lately. Y'all want to hear what she's been threatening me about? Yeah. My wife has been threatening me that she's going to retire. And I say, praise the Lord, she's going to retire. Because she'll tell me, you know, she's tired now. She needs to pivot. That's her word, pivot. I have to hear that word every day. And I said, sweetheart, when are you going to retire? She said, don't rush me. I'm, I'm going to get to it. And now she's taking two classes. I said, why are you taking two classes? She said, I want to keep up my teaching certification. I said, why are you keeping up your teaching certification if I'm getting ready to retire? She said, just in case. I said, let it go. Let it, let it go. <laughs> Now again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel and incited David, saying, against them, saying, go number Israel and Judah. So we know from 1 Chronicles chapter 21 that um, Satan put this in his heart, and we know that this, this was a sin against, um, against trusting God and, and relying on God. But um, as we read verse 1, it's Satan. Satan is responsible for putting this in David's heart, but David still had a choice to take the census or not. We know that um, we know that God still held him responsible. The writer of Samuel still held David responsible for doing it. So you can't be like Flip Wilson. Y'all do remember Flip Wilson, don't you? What did he say, Steve? The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. You can't say the devil made me do it. You ever see Christians, they start blaming other folks and other things instead of taking responsibility for themselves? Um, the adversary can stir things up, but you have to take responsibility. So in that text, in verse 1, it reminds me that Satan is, on, Satan is at work. It reminds me that David's at work. It reminds me that God is at work. Um, and it reminds me that the Lord was angry with Israel for the reason stated here. And he was angry with Israel because David incited this um, go and number Israel and Judah. According to the text here, verse 2, it kind of tells us that the king said to Joab, the commander of the army um, who was with him, go about now through all of the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba, and register the people, that I may know the number of the people. The word register there would be our English word muster up. So kind of muster up some people that would do this. Same word is used in verse 4 as well. Um, register, muster up. So the word is kind of used twice there. But if you notice verse 3 here, this is the most odd verse in all of 2 Samuel. Can I show you this odd verse? 
But Joab said to the king, Now may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while the eyes of my Lord the king still see, while you're still living. That's a any amount of expression. While you're still alive, may the Lord continue to add numbers. But why does my Lord the king delight in this thing? Can you all imagine Joab out of all people being spiritual? Okay, wrong side. Let me ask this side. Can you imagine Joab out of all people being spiritual? It's like Joab saying, oh, king, don't, don't, don't do this. Joab? Out of all the people that could have said this? And the writer said, yes, Joab says this. And Joab is wisely warning him, don't number the people. Don't depend on numbers. Don't depend on, um, um, on your own strength. Nevertheless, the king word prevailed against Joab and against the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army went out from the presence of the king to register the people of Israel. So um, the king went out. The king is still the king, and the king, the king naturally got his way. So, of course, verse 5 tells us they crossed the Jordan, and they camped at um, Ariar, and um, on the right side of the city, that is in the middle of the Valley of Gad. And toward Gazer. Um, they came to Gilad and said to the land of Tatim Tashai, or Tasin Hushai. Um, and they came to Dan Jaran, Jaan, and around the Sedan, or Sedan, and came to the fortress of Tyre and to all the city of the. Um, um, Hivites and the Canaanites, and they and they went to the south of Judah to Beersheba. So when they had gone out through the whole land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. And Joab gave the number of the registration of the people to the king, and there were in Israel eight hundred thousand valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000 men. All right, if I can just stop there for a moment. God gave him nine months to change his mind. Matter of fact, I think the text tells us nine months and 20 days. But did David change his mind in nine months and 20 days about the census? The answer is no. Why didn't David change his mind? Because he probably had a stubborn heart. He wanted what he wanted. You see, there's sins of the spirit, but there's also sins of the flesh. And David was involved with the sin of the flesh. David's pride was on the line. David's ego was on the line. And David wanted to assess his strength by his military might. His stubborn heart began to bleed out. And, um, of course, Joab and, Joab and the commanders carried it out. But David's the one that's incited for this because David's the one that caused this. And I want to ask you and I, um, is there any area of our life that we may be suffering with a stubborn heart, not listening to the faithful promises of God, but we've gotten into our stubborn heart and we want to do it our way? Um, I was telling a student in my office the other day, if you trust the Lord, the Lord will probably give you the desires of your heart. And you know what he said to me? The Lord ain't moving fast enough. He's got to help the Lord out. I chuckled because I thought he was playing with me, but when I looked back up, he was dead serious. He said the Lord is not moving fast enough. You know, I thought about that. For some of us, when the Lord doesn't move in our timing or in our way, we get stubborn toward the Lord. Or when he doesn't give us what we think we want, when we want it, we can get stubborn toward the Lord. And I'm just here to remind you, don't get that stubborn toward the Lord. Amen? Because a stubborn heart often leads to a smitten heart. 
A stubborn heart leads to a smitten heart. How do I know that? Because of verse 10. Now David's heart troubled him after he had numbered the people. Wait a minute. That should have been verse 1, shouldn't it? It should have been it troubled him before he numbered the people. But notice it's troubling him after he's numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I've done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have acted very foolishly. The only thing worse than waiting is wishing that you had. The only thing worse than waiting is wishing that you had. Can anybody look in the rearview mirror and wish you wouldn't have done that? Okay, wrong church. Let me, let me ask that question again. Has anybody ever looked in the rearview mirror and said, I wish I wouldn't have done that? Okay, right church now. And, but, but it's too late. You've already, you've already done it. You've already carried it out. Now your heart is smitten. Now you're saying, what have I done? Um, have you ever told somebody a piece of your mind and you wish you'd kept it a piece of your mind to yourself? Okay, I'm in the right church now. Has anybody ever used some swear words or some cuss words and you wish you'd have kept them to yourself? Steve said, oh, no, that's not the time to say nothing now. That's not the time to say anything. Has anybody ever depended on something else beside God and wish you depended on God? Wish you would have waited on God? You know, um, David's heart is troubled. Um, it was a sin of the will. It got him in trouble. I love what David said here. And if you, and if you like me, I like circling things in my Bible. Can I show you something to circle? He says, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Verse 11, I have sinned, no, no, excuse me, verse 10. I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Kind of reminds me of those Psalms, Psalm 51, Lord, um, I've sinned against you and you alone. David realized as a man after God's own heart that he has sinned greatly by not depending on the Lord. I've sinned greatly in what I've done. And then he begs God for forgiveness. But now, oh Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant. I was reading Chuck Swindoll's book today um, concerning this, this chapter, and I can still hear Chuck Swindoll. Y'all know who I'm talking about when I say Chuck Swindoll? I can still hear his voice when he's going over things like this. But now, O oh Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have acted very foolishly. Does that sound like regret to you all? It sounds like regret to me. You, you get down the road and you say, this is nine months and um, 20 days. And then all of a sudden, this thing is, you know, I want y'all to notice something whenever you go back and read First and Second Samuel. When, 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 when those are in charge, fail to pray, they get fleshly results every time. When they fail to ask God, God, what should I do in this situation? And um, as I've been going through First and Second Samuel, boy, it's been reminding me that I got to step up my prayer life. When David arose, according to verse 11, in the morning, the word of the Lord came to um, the prophet Gad, David's seer. This is David's prophet, saying, go and speak to David. Thus says the Lord, I am offering you um, three things. Choose for yourself one of them, which I will do to you. You know what? I don't like this verse. You know why? Because it kind of reminds me of my grandma. My grandma said, now you've done the crime. It's time for your punishment. Which one of these punishments do you want? And neither one of these punishments kind of work for me. She said, now you either choose or I'm going to choose. And um, I said, Grandma, I just want your grace and mercy. 
She said, I understand that, but you're going to get one of these punishments to go along with my grace and mercy. She said, the grace and mercy is I'm not giving you all three of these things. I wonder had my grandma been reading 2 Samuel chapter 24. Because here's what the three things that God says. So Gad came to David and told him and said to him, Shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Dr. Swindoll said, do you want it to be a slow punishment? Slow over seven years? I said, Dr. Swindoll, don't say that. Or, number two, y'all ready for number two? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Do you want it to be a quick thing? And the first one, do you want it to be slow? Do you want to be on the run for 90 days? Do you want it to be a quick thing? Or number three, <coughs> or shall there be three days of pestilence in your land? Now consider and see what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Really? Um, let us now fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. Wow. If he would have just thought about the consequences in verse 1. I said if he would have just thought about the consequences in verse 1. I think he could have... Um, he could have navigated his way around this trouble. But because he had a stubborn heart in verse 1, ordered the censors and ordered the registration or ordered them to muster up some men, 800,000, then 500,000. Now he's coming back with a smitten heart. Lord, I've sinned greatly. I've been foolish. Oh, here's why I should tell you this, because I read this today as well. Take some time to think about the consequences of your actions before you get into your actions. Think about the consequences of your actions. I had a man come see me some months ago. And um, beautiful family, five kids. And um, one kid, 17, next kid, they were like two years apart. 17, 15, 13, 11. I think the youngest one was like eight or something like that. And um, what had happened was he fell in love with his secretary. And he said his wife doesn't treat him like his secretary does. And his secretary is so sweet and so wonderful. So he decided to leave home for his secretary. I said, dude, you're going to regret that decision. He said, oh, no, she's the greatest woman in the world. And she told me she would never change if I marry her. And she's my I'm, I'm with the wrong crowd here. But she's my soulmate. I said, really? I said, and she's willing to fool around with you, knowing that you're married? It's a recipe for disaster. He said, you don't understand, Pastor. This is going to be the greatest marriage ever. Do y'all even want to hear the ending? <laughs> This brother, from, 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 no need to. <laughs> is, it, is it strange for me to tell y'all he's miserable, miserable now? He said she's worse than the first wife. He said at least the first wife would clean the house. The second wife won't even clean the house. She won't wash the dishes. She won't make up the bed. She doesn't wash clothes. She just knows how to spend lots of money. <laughs> I said, whatever you sow, that's how you reap. You know, he, he had a stubborn heart when he came to see me the first time. He had a smitten heart when he came to see me the second time. He said, ask the Lord, preacher, talking to me, ask the Lord, preacher, to take, take the consequences away. I said, brother, I've been asking the Lord to take the calories out of everything I eat for a long time. He said, what is that supposed to mean? That means he hadn't removed those calories and he's not going to remove your consequences. 
I mean, we can chuckle at that, but isn't that true? Somehow we, we want a, a special, can I use this word, a special dispensation for our sin. There's no special dispensation for sin. Are, are you all with me this morning? I mean, this afternoon? There's no special dispensation for sin. And like I said last time I was standing here, you may choose your sin, but you don't always get to choose your consequences. Matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first time in Scripture that I can remember uh, that God says, what do you want your punishment to be out of this list? As far as I can remember now, y'all, y'all, Pastor Steve, you fix this if I'm wrong. But I think this is the first time I've ever seen this in Scripture where God says, what do you want your, what do you want your punishment to be? Of course, he gave him a list. Is it A, B, or C? Yeah. And guess what? You won't like either one of them. Whether it's the slow one or the, fat, or the long one or, or the one that will affect his people. And, of course, David has a shepherd's heart. David has a shepherd's heart. And I wouldn't doubt it that if David would wish that he could take the punishment for everybody. But, you know, when you sin, can I just tell you that sin not only hurts you and sin not only hurts God, but you know who else sin hurts? Everybody around you. And, um... It hurts your family. It hurts your coworkers. Sin hurts everyone around you. Um, sin hurt David's family. And we see here in the next few verses that he's going to have not a stubborn heart and a smitten heart, but he's going to have a, a, a suffering heart, starting in verse 15. So as we go down to verse 15, are y'all still with me? So the Lord sent the pestilence in upon the, um, Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And 70,000 men of the people of Dan to Beersheba died. Can you imagine because of someone sin that how many people died? 70,000. Are, are y'all still with me on this side? That's a lot of people that's affected by his sin. 70,000 died. When the angel of the Lord stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who destroyed the people, it is enough. Now relax your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor. I, I, are y'all hearing me? It's, it's like the 70,000 people. That's, that's a lot of people. Um, verse, verse 17, then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking down the people and said, Behold, it is I who have sinned, and it is I who have done wrong. But these sheep. Do you see that shepherd's heart come out? But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. He didn't want the people to suffer. But he realized that um, he caused this. I love um, verse 17. He says, um, I have sinned. It is I who have done wrong. It is I, I did the sinning. But the problem is when you sin, you don't just keep that punishment to yourself. You may spread that punishment all around. Uh, My brother went online, and he was curious about what's going on here at Calvary Chapel. And um, he, he wanted to hear, to see what, he wanted to experience our services here at Calvary Chapel. So he went online and he listened to one of my sermons. And I said, praise the Lord, what, what did you think? He said, well, you were telling about the car story, about your car that, the, that, 
that I that dad took from us and I, I, that, that dad took from you and you had to walk home and all that stuff. He said, but you failed to tell them that that affected me too. I said, how did it affect you? He said, you couldn't drive me around anymore. I said, are you more concerned about you or are you concerned about me? He said, I'm concerned about both of us. We both had to walk places because of your sin. And I said, I'm sorry. He said, no, I was mad with you for a year because he made me go without a car for a year. And he made both of us walk. And I told my brother, it's, it's not that big of a deal. He said, I want you to know something else, too. Mama was mad with you. I said, why was she mad with me? Because she had to be our Uber driver, our taxi driver places because you didn't have a car anymore. And because of your sin, you made me walk with you and you made her life miserable because all of a sudden she had to take us places. I said, man, I didn't know it was that big of a deal. And he said, as a matter of fact, grandma told me on a couple of occasions, why couldn't he just... I said, man, don't ever go back to Calvary Chapel's webpage again to listen to nothing I got to say. Because this was my sin and it's personal. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Now, how am I doing with you all tonight? I wish I could say like this lady back here who said, have you ever put anything depending on something more than God? And she said a resounding No. But every time I put some things ahead of God, boy, did I pay the price. Boy, did I pay the price. You know, I'm happily married now. Been married to my wife 27 years. Praise the Lord. Matter of fact, we've been together 31 years. We dated for three, engaged one, married 27. Amen. And um, we're going we're gonna to try to do it another 30 years, and then we're going to go to heaven. Amen. Um, I don't want to stay on earth because she might see me do something that she don't like. I may turn the toilet paper the wrong way in the bathroom. Never mind, y'all ain't with me like I'm trying to talk here. But anyway, <laughs> you know, I tried to date a girl one time. And you know what this girl told me, Steve? She said, I really do like you, but I don't want a guy that's into the church. And I definitely don't want a guy that's a preacher. She said, so if you stop preaching and you stop going to church so much, then I'll be your girlfriend. And she was pretty to me. I said, well, she said, if you stop going to church and you stop being a preacher, because I was a lay preacher, she said, I'll be your girlfriend. And she said, we can get married. And the problem was, not that I chose to do that, but I thought about it for a few days. I thought about not being so much into the church because I wanted her flesh. Y'all praying with me? And God had to get a hold of me to say, you know what? That's the wrong road to go down. Every time I see her now, I wave across the room and I keep right on walking. Because the, there's nothing that can separate me from the love of God. I love God more than anything else in my life. And I've, I'm always wondering, what would my life be like if I would have given in to her demand to not be so much into the church, to not be so much into God, stop preaching, and I'll be your girlfriend? You know what? I think that was one of my early tests. I think that was one of my early tests. When I got married, I'd been married for a few years, came up on my seventh year, Lady came to church one day, and she said, I really like how you and your wife operate. She said, you know what? She said, I bet you if I was your wife, I could take the ministry to another level. I said, oh, my goodness. I couldn't believe she would even come to church and tell me something like that. But I had better sense then because I told my wife. <laughs> I ain't going to even tell y'all how my wife handled that situation. But, you know, she ran her off. She said, oh, no, we're not going to do things like that at our church. Because the devil will always trip you up if you let him. You got to make sure that you put God first. So I've talked about a stubborn heart and I've talked about a smitten heart. 
I've talked about a suffering heart, but let me talk about a sacrificing heart. Oh, by the way, um, Pastor Hoppy, um, I don't have a verse to prove this, but I want to say it. If you don't like it, you can tell me don't say that no more. But 70,000 men lost their life. And I read today, I didn't know this until today, that the 70,000 that lost their life were possibly soldiers. So that David wouldn't depend on soldiers more than he depended on the Lord. I thought that was a cool fight that I never thought of, that the Lord would take soldiers away and not just common men away because God was making a point to him to tell him to depend on me. Okay, let me go back to the last little bit here. We're in um, verse 18 through 25, and it's, and it's time to roll. So Gad came to David that day and said to him, Go up and erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor. And um, Arana, the Jebusite, David went up according to the word of the Lord, just as the Lord had commanded him. And Arana um, looked down and saw the king and his servants crossing toward him. And Arana went out and bowed his head um, to the ground before the king. Then Arana said, Why has my lord, this, um, the king, come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be held back from the people. And Arana said to David, let my lord the king take um, and offer up what is good in his sight. Look at look the oxen for the um, burnt offering, the threshing floor, sledges, um, and yokes of oxen for the wood. Everything, O king, Arana gives to you, to the king. And Arana said to the king, may the lord your God accept you. However, the king said to Arana, no. But I will surely buy it from you for a price. For I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. So David brought the threshing floor and also for 50 shekels of silver. David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Thus the Lord was moved by prayer for the land and the plague was held by it. From Israel. Well, some say this is the best part of 2 Samuel. That he buys this place, he purchases this place, he wants this land, he wants he doesn't want this land for free. He wants to pay an offering for this land because he doesn't want to take anything and offer it to the Lord for something that didn't cost him anything. You know, years earlier. I think it was um, um, Abraham who wanted to go and offer um, his son at this same spot in Israel. I think um, years later, the temple was erected. David purchased it, but his son would build on it for the temple of our God. Can you imagine how God redeems um, once we turn our face toward him? Once we pray and once we do something for him, how God redeems. Um, God redeemed this land for himself. He, he used Gad. Um, so Gad came to David and said to him, go up and erect an altar. Um, it's at this place that God changed things. David purchased this land. He sacrificed to the Lord and built this altar. And God would use it not only in his life, but he would also use it in the life of his son, Solomon, to build the temple. You know, if I'm not allegorizing, which I don't think I am, what spiritual legacy are you leaving for your children? What spiritual legacy are you leaving for your children? You know, for my family and I, we've always tried to keep our girls in church. I always try to teach them to pray. I always try to teach them the word. I always try to help them make good, godly decisions. We show them in the word where this, you don't want to end up like this. You want to make a godly decision. And you know what? 
we still parent our kids to this day. Um, our oldest daughter is 25. Our youngest daughter is 23. They're still precious to us. We love them dearly. We still have them in the Word. And you know what? It has paid off. It's almost like they got a built-in spiritual legacy. If, 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 if Sylvia and I, my wife, were to close our eyes today, they would still remember those lessons that we taught them from God's Word. What legacy are you leaving for your children? You know what? I can't leave them a legacy because I'm too broken or too broken up or too whatever. No, you can always leave a legacy for your children. Teach them how to pray. Teach them how to read the Word. Teach them how to live a life that's led by the Spirit. Also, you don't have to go into the details, but when you've made a mistake, also let them learn from your mistakes that they don't, pre they don't repeat the, the same mistake in the next generation. Let them learn from your life. I've, I've, I've let my kids into my mistakes and said, no, this is where I made a mistake. You don't have to make the same mistake. Praise God. And um, I thank for, for many who read the book of 2 Samuel chapter 24. When he purchases this land, this land that he could have gotten for free for 50 shekels of silver, he redeems the time. He redeems the situation. And he shows that he's a man after God's own heart. So tonight, you got to ask yourself, where are you? Where are you? This makes it a Sunday morning a sermon again. Because you could have walked in those doors tonight and you could have you walked in with a stubborn heart. Stubborn. You're just going to do it your way. Or tonight, you may have walked in with a heart of regret, a smitten heart, saying, you know what? I made some mistakes. And I wish I could get things right. For some of you, you may be under God's judgment right now. You may have a suffering heart. Uh, for somebody else in here, you could have a sacrificing heart. But you, it's you and the Lord. You have to decide where you are tonight. Whether you're in a stubborn heart. <clears throat> by the way, let y'all in on a little secret. Don't tell nobody. This is between us now. Sometimes I've gone through all four in the same day. Where I've been stubborn, where I've, where I've had a smitten heart, where I've had a um, suffering heart, and where I've had a sacrificing heart in the same day. Don't tell nobody, I felt like I've been through the same four in the same hour before. But where I'm trying to live now, I'm trying to make sure my heart is always um, broken before the Lord, always sacrificing before the Lord, because a stubborn heart. Brothers and sisters, a stubborn heart, I promise you, won't get you anywhere with God. Tonight, if your heart is, you know your heart is stubborn. I know the praise team is coming. Y'all can come on. If you, if you know your heart is stubborn, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Melt my heart tonight, God. Melt my heart before you. If you realize your heart is smitten, you know what I've done wrong. Don't get stuck there. Don't get stuck there. Because you could live in regret for the rest of your life and never move. Um, don't get stuck with a suffering heart. But let's move toward a sacrificing heart. Lord, I want to sacrifice before you and keep things right before you. Um, notice, if you haven't heard this yet, notice this. If you make a mistake, at least while you're alive, there's still grace. There's still God's mercy. You still have time to get it right with God. And I want to tell you to get it right with God right now. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait till tomorrow. Get it right with God right now.